Television, the drug of the nation, breeding ignorance and feeding radiation. Now, if you don't recognize those lyrics, then I guess you've got yourself some homework for the middle of the week. <laughs> now, more importantly, remember, don't believe everything you see on TV. And don't be seduced by it. Otherwise, you might end up like poor Andrew does in tonight's story. Now, my dear friends, it's Wednesday, week's halfway over, and it's time for you to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. Because I've got a little story to tell you, and it goes something like this. Andrew turned on the cable box. It was brand new, straight from the company. He'd read up on this model from the internet, and being the tech junkie he was, he was absolutely taken in by the rave reviews he'd read of it from fellow geeks on the internet. He didn't know quite what to expect, but he knew he'd enjoy it. It cost a pretty penny, though. It made him grateful he worked at the major company that he did work at, which in turn made him grateful that he'd focused entirely on what had mattered excelling in high school, and then in the Ivy League college he'd attended. It took its sweet time to load up, though. He tapped his knee with his index finger impatiently. Come on, come on, he thought. What could he say? He was eager to watch his shows. Only, after an hour, it was still loading. By this point it was midnight, and he was tired as hell from his day at work. Mumbling angrily to himself, he went into his room, changed into his pyjamas and got into bed. It was just his luck that, after not just a hard day at work, but the whole week he'd been waiting for the new cable box to arrive, it would go and pull this shit. Oh well, nothing to be really done about it. He was asleep soon enough. The next day arrived. Fucking finally. Getting up, strolling eagerly out into the living room and sitting down on the couch, he grabbed the remote and switched on the TV. Sure enough, it was the news. Now, he'd never been a news guy, so his initial reaction was that this was boring as hell, when something caught his eye. The picture on the TV was amazing. Simply amazing. It was like high def, but better. The image quality was so sharp, and the color so bright and vivid. A wide smile slowly appeared on his face as he kept watching the news, just soaking in the fact that, yes, he'd made an excellent choice buying this. So, there he was watching the news, just enjoying his new cable box that he'd plugged into his TV. But he noticed something odd happening. One of the main anchors. His eye kept twitching. First, just a tiny bit. Barely perceptible. But then more frequently and more noticeably. About 20 minutes after it started happening, he was at the point where he was twitching his neck and jerking his head. Andrew's brow furrowed with confusion as he watched this thing happening. This didn't make any damn sense. Why would a news anchor be acting like that on live television? That wasn't the weirdest thing, though. What was far, far weirder was that his partner didn't seem to notice what was happening. She kept reading the news, smiling, and when she passed the reading off to him, he sputtered and barked out the news while jerking his head and neck violently. At this, she simply smiled warmly at him and then back into the camp. At this point, Andrew was getting pretty damn freaked out. So he turned the TV off and decided to go and do something else. <sighs> what the hell was wrong with this? Must be some issue with the station. He did feel bothered, though. Especially given that he spent all his money on the damn thing. Still, he went about his day. He made himself breakfast, 
did some work on a major report for the AGM of his union local, and then headed out, having remembered that he had to drop off some government forms at various offices downtown. So, he left. In his living room, the still warm cable box sat snugly beneath the TV. As he went about his day, though, he felt chilled. This nagging tension eating at the back of his neck that made his hairs rise on end. He got home seven hours later. The sun was low and red, shining a soft yet dull orange glow across the landscape outside his home. He got inside, took his shoes off, and casually moved over to the couch and plopped down, switching the TV on with the remote as he did so. What happened to be on was one of his favourite cop shows, the ones where they were rough, tough and gritty, and always got their guy in the end, even if they had to cross all the lines to do so. For the next half hour or so, he watched the hour-long show, enjoying the hell out of it as he did so. And then, something weird happened. In a tense, serious interrogation scene, the lead detective couldn't stop giggling and glancing at the camera. An idiotic grin plastered on his face. The interrogation continued as normal. The criminal started yelling that he'd never snitch. The detective's partner screamed that he'd go away for 20 to life. But by that point, the lead detective was laughing his ass off, staring directly into the camera. No one else in the scene noticed. At this point, Andrew was getting bothered by all this. Way, way bothered. His heart started to race, and subtle yet raw fear crept into his heart and began to nest there. His hand trembling, he turned the TV off. After it was off, he quickly stood up and walked into his bedroom, trying to put all of this behind him. Climbing into bed without changing into his bedclothes, he reflected on how this was an incredibly freaky situation that he had to get away from for the moment and try to figure out. He didn't think of what was happening, though. He actively tried not to think about it. In that, he succeeded, drifting off to sleep quickly. Before he fell asleep, though, something happened. His mind drifting to what he'd seen on the TV through the cable box. He found himself groggily, so much so that he wouldn't remember when the next morning arrived, giggling uncontrollably at what he remembered from the news and the cop drama. As an odd sort of fog descended over his mind that was in no way related to him falling asleep, he found himself utterly entranced by what he had seen. Getting up the next morning, he went through the usual morning routine. Shower, breakfast, getting dressed, the whole deal. He specifically avoided turning the TV on. He wasn't going anywhere near that damn thing. He'd seen enough horror movies to know that you don't fuck with shit like that. Maybe it was an issue with the station. Maybe the damn thing was haunted. Even still, he specifically avoided turning the TV on for the next few hours. Just something about it and the cable box kept him away. That didn't last. He went about his day, he thought about it, and finally told himself he was being ridiculous. After all, it was probably an issue with the station after all. So, that evening, relaxing on the couch with some popcorn, he turned the TV on and, controlling the cable box with the TV remote, switched the channel to one of those golden oldie stations. The ones that played TV shows from decades back. He landed on one of those family dramas from the 50s. The kind with the picturesque and perfect upper-middle-class nuclear family. This was the one where the Clyde family, headed by Mr. Arnold Clyde, and his wife, Mrs. Jean Clyde, raised their two sons, Bobby and Bill, teenager and preteen, respectively, and weaved through the trials of middle-class America in the 1950s. 
Andrew had watched it a number of times. It was wholesome in a way that he liked. Anyways, in this episode, Jean Clyde was alone in the kitchen, cleaning the floor. She was wearing one of those 50s dresses with an apron, and had her hair done up in an extremely well-kept style. The kind that only people in fictional TV shows ever had in day-to-day -day life. She had a sharp but kind face. Beautiful in that movie star kind of way. As she cleaned the floor, she was muttering somewhat angrily. But not too angrily. This was the 50s. About being left to do all the work by herself. Then, she stopped and stood up, slowly turning to face the camera. Andrew blinked. This was it. He'd had it. He reached for the remote, grasped it, and lifting it, moved his finger to press down on the power button. He was stopped, though, as the lady on the screen started to speak. Hold it right there, Han she said, grinning somewhat wickedly as she rested a hand on her hip. Andrew froze, his eyes widening. He blinked a few times, trying to see if he was just dreaming or seeing things. Sure enough, when he opened them again, she was still there. She laughed a tiny bit as she, apparently, witnessed this running her free hand through her hair. She then continued speaking. Now, if you're done acting like a scared little goose, we can have a nice chat. She then smiled sweetly, the way an archetypical mother would smile to her five-year-old. As Andrew witnessed this, his heart wasn't beating hard in fear. Chills weren't running down his spine. Oddly enough, he found himself drawn in by all this. He felt a blissful joy rising up inside of him. He wanted to see this, and wanted to hear her out. Sure enough, that's what he did, letting out a relaxed sigh as he laid back on the couch. Jean Clyde clapped her hands together excitedly as she saw him relax himself. Well, ain't that a nice cold glass of lemonade? Now, where to start? She paused for a brief moment, her eyes running across the ceiling, and then quickly refocused them on Andrew again. Smiling even more brightly, she said sweetly, but with a dash of fire in her voice, All right. See, hon? I'm about to start moving on. But before I do, I'd like to get to know you a little more. See, and I'm just going to be honest here. I like you. A lot. I also think I can really help you out. Show you things you've never seen before. As she said that last sentence, her voice got lower and huskier. It was at this moment that Andrew, his eyes connected with Clyde's, noticed that she was staring intensely at him and breathing very heavily. He then noticed that, and he didn't know how this was possible. She was staring into him, if that makes sense. He didn't know how to feel, honestly. A part of him deep down, a core part, was screaming at him to turn the cable box off and get rid of it. Drive it out to the ocean, smash it with a hammer into a million bits on the pier, then dump them into the water. Get into the car and never look back. He didn't, though. He didn't because he wanted to hear what she had to say. As she looked into him, he felt giddy inside. He didn't know how or why, but he felt that this was good, that she was good and that this was something he had to see through. Jean Clyde continued. Okay, now we can get started. She spoke firmly, 
as if she had a mission. She then casually moved over to the knife drawer, as if she was getting ready to cut a pie into various pieces, and opened it. She deftly plucked a knife out of the drawer and turned to face the camera, smiling at Andrew. She smiled brightly as she held the knife in front of her. She smiled brightly as she lifted it, and she smiled brightly as she began to cut, hard and deep, into her neck, tracing the blade into a wide cut across the entire front of it. As the blade sliced the skin open, just as if it were butter, blood splashed and rushed out of her neck all over the front of her in a violent cascade. As Andrew watched, the one thing he couldn't forget later on, that never left him, was that she was smiling the entire time. This was too much. There was the part of Andrew that wanted to keep him watching, that made him feel like he needed to keep watching. More than that, he felt a strong urge, a near overwhelming drive in fact, to touch the cable box. That's all it'll take, that voice inside of him said. Just reach out and touch the cable box. You will see then. You will absolutely see. He stared hard into Clyde's eyes as the pressure built inside of him. Soon, he was thinking it would be fine. What harm could there be? Wasn't it worth it to take the risk to see what this person wanted to show him? Before he knew what was happening, he found himself pushing himself off the couch and taking small, slow steps towards the TV and cable box. Then, out of nowhere, shoving forcefully from deep within him, the part of himself from deep down finally wrestled itself into his main consciousness. As Andrew stood there before the couch, his mind screamed, Get it off! through his entire body. With that, he desperately grabbed at the remote and stabbed his thumb down on the power button as hard as he could. The picture on the TV disappeared into a sea of darkness, as the cable box's front lights dimmed as it shut down. A few moments later, his blood racing and tension tightening his nerves, he got up and paced back and forth. This wasn't good. This was not good. What the fuck was that? His mind was racing a million miles a second. Why was he about to touch the cable box? As he paced, he felt terrified shudders race through his body. Whatever it was in that thing had nearly got him. It nearly fucking got him. Tears of pure fear welling in his eyes. He stopped and glanced at the cable box. There it sat. Small, black and compact, with the company logo on the front side of it. He knew he had to get rid of it. He knew this. By the end of the evening... The cable box was dropped beside the dumpster outside his apartment. Good fucking riddance, Andrew thought as he walked away from the box back into the building. He went to bed early that night. That night he dreamed of Jean Clyde, smiling as the laughing detective from the cop show put his gun to her head. As he pulled the trigger and the bang of the pistol firing exploded into his ears, he awoke, his eyes shooting open. The next day was a work day. It was easy, very boring and routine, to be honest. Andrew spent most of the day going through his sales reports, compiling them into a report for his supervisor. In the break room during his lunch break, he sat by himself and ate his lunch alone, as Brenda and Ryan from accounting gossiped about Jenny's out-of-wedlock pregnancy with her boyfriend and how they had no idea she'd break the news to her husband. Oof, it was that kind of day. 
Something ate at Andrew, though. Ever so gradually, as he was working on his reports for most of his day, his mind kept drifting to the cable box. His initial feelings of horror and terror aimed at the cable box were now subsiding and being replaced by curiosity. He shouldn't have felt curious, given what he'd experienced. Not in the slightest. Yet he did. At first it was just idle curiosity, and he, rightly, shoved it down and ignored it. Then it came back again. Harder, stronger, and more fiercely. After an hour, all he could think about was the cable box. Thoughts of what was on it, and what Jean Clyde had to show him, besieged his mind. His mind kept going back to Jean Clyde, and of how wondrous what she had to show him was. This was all quite illogical, but something had seized in his mind. Something that even he could somehow vaguely perceive was alien to said mind. By the time another hour had passed, his mind and body flushed with the feelings of giddiness and fogginess that had migrated into his brain the night he watched television on the cable box for the first time. He had left work early to race home, desperately hoping that the cable box was where he had left it. It was... Jumping out of his car, he raced over to the cable box and, picking it up, checked it for damage. None. Soon after, his car was parked and he was in his living room, reconnecting the TV to the cable box as quickly as he could, his hands trembling with sheer excitement and anticipation as he did so. Minutes later, he turned the TV and the cable box on, and, appearing on the screen, was Jean Clyde, smiling lovingly down at him. I knew you'd come back, sweetheart. Of course you would have. Now, I need to show you something. As Andrew stared up at her, he could vaguely feel the tears running down his face as her soft, loving, gentle voice cascaded over him. He knew what he had to do. He knew. He reached forward and laid his hand on the cable box. At that moment, Clyde saw it, and her eyes lit up as a white, excited smile appeared on her face. As he noticed her smile brightening even more, with even more sheer excitement, he felt something. Not just the ecstatic joy and bliss that had come to him from Jean Clyde and his connection to her now, no, not just that. What he felt most of all was an icy chill, slowly migrating from his hand up his arm, and then through his body. At first it was just cold, like an icy breeze in the Arctic. Then it started to turn to pure bliss, as if it were morphine. The beautiful lovely wave of good feeling radiated throughout his entire body. As he sunk deeper and deeper into bliss, he looked into the eyes of Jean Clyde, seeing her return that same bliss to him in her eyes. Andrew never showed up to work the next day, nor the next, nor the next. No one else heard from him either, Eventually, a missing persons report was issued. When the police entered his apartment the week after he disappeared, they didn't find him there. They didn't find anybody. They did, however, find the living room carpet soaked with dried, rotting blood. The room stunk to high heaven from it. Also missing, though the police didn't know to notice this, was the cable box Andrew had purchased some weeks back. The police did launch an investigation into Andrew's disappearance, and investigated the possibility of foul play, but they could find no evidence of anything, nor any leads. So, it went nowhere. Andrew was never seen again. A week later, in Moscow, Russia, 
Alexander Korolev, a 19-year-old hacker taking a break from fishing credit card numbers from gullible Americans, was leaning back in his chair, his feet on his desk. In his lap was a bowl of chocolate ice cream, as one of his favourite episodes of his favourite programme finished downloading. As it started, he smiled in a satisfied fashion. Jean Clyde was angrily cleaning the floor. Then, something weird happened. Stopping abruptly, and then standing up and facing the camera, Jean smiled, speaking in perfect Russian, with a sweet, kind-natured voice. She said, Hello, Alexander. We need to talk. Well, that one was a bit nuts, wasn't it? Hope it's put you off watching too much TV. It's not a good thing for you, you know. Not quite as bad as what happened to poor Andrew in general, but you never know. Well, that's me done for the evening. I'll be back with you on Friday night, and I do so hope you'll join me. Until then, bye-bye.